late Governor General lies in state for final viewing. More awareness and understanding needed on cancer. And Medang dealing with widespread cases of malaria. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thank you for joining me for Thursday's news. A Lion State viewing ceremony for the late Governor General Grand Chief Sir Michael Ogio was held at the Government House in Port Moresby this morning. Among dignitaries who paid their respects were Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, Chief Justice Sir Salamo India, diplomats, state ministers, government officials and departmental heads. The casket of the late Governor General Grand Chief C. Michael Ogio arrived at the government house this morning for the state viewing. Paul Beres from the PNGDF soldiers and Navy carried the casket into the government house. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill, Chief Justice C. Salomo Injia, diplomats, state ministers, members of parliament and heads of departments were present to pay tribute and offer condolences to the family of C. Michael Ogio. The casket was accompanied by the family of Sir Michael Ogio and wife Lady Esme Ogio. Sir Michael Ogio, 75 years old, from Tinput in the autonomous region of Bougainville, is survived by five children and eight grandchildren from his previous marriage. He is the second Governor General to pass away while serving as the Governor General of Papua New Guinea. Our current Governor General is lying in state and we have the incumbent Governor General who's going to be sworn in on Tuesday. So this is a very rare scenario. We've actually, this has created part of history uh, for Papua New Guinea uh, in this regard. But um, by Tuesday that will all be resolved uh, when the new Governor General will be sworn in uh, to Parliament um, on uh, Tuesday. Uh, the program is uh, being fully funded and orchestrated by the National Events uh, Office through the chairmanship of uh, Walter Yangamina and also uh, through the Protocol and the Foreign Affairs Department and of course Government House. Eric Orupma, National MTV News. Prime Minister Peter O'Neill will be filing an application to intervene in the Ombudsman Commission's constitutional reference on the increase of election-related fees. The Supreme Court was notified by his lawyer Tiffany Twivey this afternoon. Ombudsman Commission lawyer Virgil Narakobi said in courts that they have no objection to the PM's intervention to intervene and he noted that no other party has shown any active interest in the matter. Chairman of the Constitutional Law Reform Committee was represented by lawyer Greg Manda on the matter, but they have not filed an application to intervene. The hearing of the matter has been adjourned to next Monday, the 27th February at 1.30 p.m. While a debate rages over the lack of attention given to the National Cancer Treatment Center in Ley, more light is being shed on other important areas that need help. Dr. Christopher Kenny has, the Chief Executive Officer of Enga Hospital, says more awareness and understanding is needed in the early detection of cancers. While awareness can be done in urban areas, it is much more difficult getting information out to rural areas. Cancer affects 8% of the population, that's over 600,000 people. Angao Hospital houses the only cancer treatment facility in Papua New Guinea. This is where referrals are made from all over the country. But there is a problem. Many of the patients referred to the National Cancer Treatment Facility are diagnosed when the disease is in its advanced stages. Dr. Christopher Kenny Hertz, Angau's chief executive officer, says the key in keeping cancer in check in Papua New Guinea is in early detection and treatment. If we took our population at the National Cancer Center, took them anywhere else in the world, had the smartest doctors, the newest drugs, and the best equipment, their results would be the same as we have now. It's because we're getting patients too late in a disease process. We're getting patients at end stage disease. We should be focusing on not what we don't have, but what we do have. Cancer is treated 
in three ways, usually in a combination of those. Cancer is treated via surgery. We have surgeons. Cancer is treated by chemotherapy. Uh, the PNG Cancer Relief Society supplied this hospital with a year of anti-cancer drugs. And thirdly, we have radiotherapy, and we have a problem there. We have an old machine. It's past its life. A treatment that may have taken 20 minutes at one time now may take up to a day. For people living in urban areas, getting out the message of early detection is relatively easy. But the hospital management is faced with the enormous challenge of communicating that same message to people in rural areas. Many of those people don't have road access or have little financial means of paying their way into Lay City to get tested. What we do have here are good surgeons. What we do have is is new machines provided to us by the national fisheries. We have, we have a new state-of-the-art mammography unit because the number one cancer in this country now, according to the World Health Organization, is breast cancer. We have a new mammography unit. We have a brand new CAT scan machine with the lasers that is yet to be in place. I suspect it'll be ready early March. Outside the confines of the hospital, what doesn't always get public attention are the financial struggles of the families of patients affected by cancer. Many of the families try to raise funds to seek treatment overseas. On average, it costs anything between 80,000 kina and 150,000 kina, depending on where they choose to go. In the years leading up to 2014, when lay resident Eddie Nagwa lost his sister to cancer, his family was expected to raise up to 30,000 kina for cancer treatment in Singapore. For many others, the cost is higher. Um, this money has been ready, so I've been coming to Papua New Guinea um, without going through long um, this operation. Last week, when the Governor-General-elect, Bob Dadai, visited the cancer unit in Leh, one of the primary concerns raised was the cost of travel, of the diagnosis and patient care. With Angau being the only treatment centre in the country, families not only have to pay for the cost of the patient, but also of the people who care for them whilst in hospital. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Leh. Acting Chief Executive Officer of the Goroka-based hospital, Dr. Max Manape, has revealed that the Provincial Health Authority is taking another approach to deal with cancer in the province. Dr. Manape said most of the people who have been diagnosed are women who have cervical cancer. The latest approach taken by the Provincial Health Authority is timely, as he said they have been advised by the PNG Cancer Treatment Centre in Leh that the centre will not be taking referrals from outside centres until further notice. Now, at this point in time, we have to really look at... According to Dr. Manape, they have found that the province has a relatively high number of women and young girls who come to the hospital are diagnosed with cervical cancer. The Eastern Highlands Provincial Government provided 600,000 kina to set up a cancer unit at the hospital. However, the hospital needs more money. The Provincial Health Authority is focusing its attention on the early detection and awareness of cancer. So we, we brought in a, a professor from Thailand, which is doctor, which is specialized in cancer early cancer programs and an early screening program, and she came and contacted the training uh, for one week from all our staff from the districts, uh, from uh, two from each district, so we can able to uh, train them, send them with the with the cryo, cryotherapy machine to go and do the screening, identify if they have, if identify any 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 signs of uh, cancer, they have just treat it. The Provincial Health Authority has also purchased eight new machines for diagnosis. The Provincial Health Authority has also set up pap smear program, which has been in operation for two years for the detection of cervical cancer. And the only way we have to now look at it is to prevent cancer at early stage. So the way forward in terms, now we are looking at, at the PHA level at the Eastern Islands is uh, doing the screening program, identifying the cancer early, and treating. Dr. Manape said since the PNG Cancer Unit in Leh has issued a notice informing outside centers not to send in referrals, they are now only providing palliative care to those patients who have been diagnosed.
While there is public anger over the limited attention given to the National Cancer Treatment Facility in Ley, there is also a push by the Eastern Highlands to counter the system's limitation. Eastern Highlands is encouraging more men and women to go for testing. But early detection is an aspect of healthcare that many people don't understand and appreciate. Mata Lewis, National MTV News, Ley. Medang province is experiencing widespread malaria cases. More people tested positive to malaria as of November last year, and the number remains high today. This has resulted to several health clinics like the Medang Urban Town Clinic setting control measures on the number of patients attended to in a day as a means of controlling its medical supplies from running out. Rachel Shise reports. As experienced nationwide, Medang is also facing a widespread of malaria and the health workers confirmed the disease the first time the province has seen a widespread as such. The unusual number of patients turning up started as of November last year. This month makes it the third month and the patient's number hasn't declined. Maybe malaria, I'm through through me, malaria. Out of 50 plus patients, 15 more than 10 are positive malaria. Sister Barong is one of those long-time serving nurses who have grown grey hair in the health profession and she says this is the first time the health centers have seen this many patients testing positive. Malaria now me plavo clock. Kisimol test results positive and a man usually just hand it to me. Already lo December and blah blah looking for this like but January na February and as a result of the steady high number of patients for three months now, the Medang Town Clinic has resorted to attending to patients only within its vicinity. At the end of the month report, you know, so in good results positive from rapid tests, and Malawan taken out could be more than the result positive. Then, you know, you know. That's why we cannot help others. Rachel Shise, National MTV News, Medang. Quick police response has prevented what could have been an armed robbery of a department store in Port Moresby. Police say a group of men tried to rob Jack's P&G, a clothing store in Port Moresby's Waigani suburb. The incident happened at 3 p.m. today. Police confirmed that gunshots were fired but could not confirm if anyone was shot. No suspects have been apprehended. National MTV News continues after the break. Stay with us. Welcome back. More than 60 homemade and 10 factory-made guns were surrendered to Joint Police and Defence Security Forces in Hela Province yesterday. The two key warlords from the Maya tribe at Como handed over their weapons, signifying the breakthrough of peace in the province. Most of the high-powered weapons used during the recent tribal fights were hired from people outside of Hela Province. The Joint Task Force Security Commanders, Chief Superintendent Samson Kua and Lieutenant Colonel John Manuai urged the warring tribes to surrender their weapons during this amnesty period. After the grace period, the Joint Task Force will arrest those who are in possession of unlicensed firearms. Its minimum penalty is 10 years imprisonment. The last gun surrender period will be held tomorrow at Tari Town. The member for Karuku, Hiri Peter Isoaimo is urging the government to speed up the commission of inquiry. He said the people of Kairuku are owed an explanation and an apology. Isoaimo also said once the commission of inquiry is done and if the Manu Manu land deal is deemed illegal, the people of Kairuku would want to use the land for agriculture. The portions of land listed in the Manu Manu land deal, portion 154, 406, 421, 422, 423 and 424 cover a vast landmass with a partially dense population. Member for Kairu Kuhiri speaking at the road junction leading into Pinu and Manu Manu asked for the commission of inquiry to be sped up. It's cost to us so we want to seek legal redress and politically um, uh, welcome the decision of our good Prime Minister for the Commission of Inquiry, uh, but we want the, the, the Commission of Inquiry established sooner 
Uh, so you know we can get right away in, into investigation the whole uh, investigating the whole issue. Huh? So you know we can put to rest if there are people who have broken uh, laws of this country in the whole exercise, then they need to be dealt with according to law. He said that he expected an apology from particular ministers and members of parliament who said that there was no villages at the portions. I. I I demand an apology from our leaders that, you know, we want factual statements and uh, not speaking of the air just to please uh, uh, anyone's uh, purposes. In, the, in this case, they've done, and uh, it's very insulting to my people of Kairikuhiri. So. The member for Kairikuhiri also said agriculture was the best option for his people. The portion of land was earmarked for a multi-million rice project that was announced earlier last year. It's still in there except that um, I think it's true we, we still need clearance from Attorney General's office um, and of course the minister to announce the, the, the quotas with regard to um, rice import and export. Uh, so. Um, unless and until we get those uh, approvals, of, um, the project is still hanging in there. But, you know, our people would welcome an agriculture project instead of a military operation here or military barracks here. Meanwhile, customary landowners want the Prime Minister to include their term of reference in the Commission of Inquiry. The Commission of Inquiry was set up earlier this month by the Prime Minister Peter O'Neill following the suspension of two ministers and department heads. Adelaide Xerox Kari, National, MTV News. Acting State Enterprise Minister Charles Abel says the Lay Tidal Basin must be utilized to create revenue for the country. Abel says the government's intention is to have an international operator chosen by PNG Ports and Kumal Consolidated Holdings to do so. He says the government will raise relevant questions to why there are delays. Bethany Harman with this report. Yesterday at the announcement of the new Kumul Telecom, the planning minister acting on the state enterprise ministry said PNG Ports and Kumul Consolidated Holdings would have to find an international operator and fast. Yeah, that's probably a question best uh, answered by uh, PNG Ports and, and KCH. But again, I state um, the government's intention is to have a good international operator come in and utilize that port and uh, generate uh, internationally competitive container movement uh, rates and cartage rates and clearance uh, through that port. When the late tidal basin was opened in 2014 by the Prime Minister, Peter O'Neill, all was set for the 700 million Kina investment to make money for the country. This is a, also another demonstration of our ability as a country and as a government, as a community and as people to deliver world-class infrastructure in our country. Part of that cost of building the infrastructure was a loan from the Asian Development Bank. But since the opening, the late tidal basin isn't in operation and may not be making money. It is certainly an issue that uh, is outstanding and uh, will raise the relevant questions uh, through PNG Ports and KCH as to what is happening in that recruitment process for that international uh, operator so that that asset can be fully utilized as was intended. The late tidal basin is the biggest port in the South Pacific. This was going to transform Papua New Guinea's economy as Lei becomes a shipping gateway in the Southeast Asia region. But that still needs to happen two years on. Bethany Hariman, National MTV News. Acting State Enterprise Minister Charles Abel says recurrent blackouts are reducing in major centres Port Moresby, Leh and Medang. He also stated that the generators bought from an Israeli company are in operation. In Leh and Port Moresby, they are supplying an additional 25 megawatts to the grid. The government purchased the two generators when caving MP Ben Micah was State Enterprise Minister. The two gas turbines are uh, operating. Uh, one has been placed at, uh, at Kanudi, and it is running. Unfortunately, it's not running off gas. It's running off uh, diesel, which means it's relatively expensive. But the point is it's also providing 25 megawatts of power when needed, uh, which was the intention. It was a quick measure to just address the immediate issues of the blackouts. 
so it was put in place, and the, and the other one is installed uh, in Ley, and I believe it is also operational. The West New Britain police will no longer be arresting suspects and detaining them at the police cell. This follows a recent health inspection that condemned the Saracolo police station cell, the only police lockup in the province unfit to use. West New Britain Provincial Police Commander Superintendent Jim Namora says the provincial health inspectors had given the police a 28-day ultimatum to refurbish the lockup facilities or face legal actions. PPC Namora says the main Kimbe police cell has also been condemned previously and is still under maintenance. He says many communities may feel the adverse effects as the lawbreakers are conveniently sent back into their own communities without being isolated. Superintendent Namora says only the suspects involved in serious crimes will be detained but may be allowed out on bail. Despite tough economic conditions in 2016, a major superannuation provider has managed to achieve solid financial results. NASFUND today announced its results for the 2016 financial year. The highlights, a net profit of 283 million kina. This figure representing an increase of 87 percent from 2015 results. NASFUND chairman Hulala Tokome announced this together with the March anticipated crediting rate for NAS fund members. It was all smiles for the executives of NAS fund today, with the board of the superannuation company announcing its 2016 full year results. The results signaled the strength of NAS fund in exceeding expectations despite tough economic conditions in the country. Among the highlights, gross asset value of 4.34 billion kina, up 7.2% from 2015. Net asset value of 4.22 billion kina, up 7.4% from 2015. Increased total membership up 4% to 535,000. Employer base increase up 5%. And more importantly, a net profit of 283 million kina, up a whopping 87% from 2015 results. On the back of all this, Achievements the board has approved at its meeting today, a crediting rate of 7.25%, equating to over 265.5 million to be paid to members' accounts for the 2016 financial year. As the economy uh, is projected to stabilise this year and perhaps um, uh, be a little bit more uh, uh, brightness going forward, uh, we do see some opportunity to continue um, not only sticking to the knitting and being conservative, but to open our, um, uh, our, our investment position to a slightly more expansionary uh, uh, stance. According to NAS Fund Chairman Hulala Tokome, whilst these results were solid, there was also a need for members to change their outlook on their superannuation savings. We'd also like to remind members that your NAS Fund savings are for the long term and about quality of life after active employment or in retirement. Members should be actively thinking and planning their future. The announcement of results by NAS Fund come at a time when it is taking a back-to-basics approach in dealing with members, signaling a new direction under the board. At the same time, improve efficiencies. Uh, you know, we talk about servicing to members and on the back of having a good fund administration system. So we're going through that process at the moment. So the uh, focus on continuously improving, uh, you, you know, is there. Members can expect their accounts to be credited by next Tuesday, February the 28th, 2017. Above all, striving to be better than what we are now and continuing to uphold members' interests is your board's focus. This is what we're all about. And we all hear about our members. Our members are who we are, and that's the reason why we exist here as NASFAN. Merabatulo, National MTV News. And now looking at our finance news, the Kina closed unchanged at 0 0.3150 US dollars in the interbank markets. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina was buying 0.3075 US dollars, 0.3967 Australian dollars, 0.2892 Euro and 34.21 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, Gold closed higher, coffee and cocoa closed lower, while copra closed the day unchanged. Palm oil and crude oil closed higher, while copper closed the day lower. 
And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 32.6 points higher, the ASX is trading at 20.44 points lower, and the All Ordinary is closed at 17.58 points lower. Provincial and district administrations not submitting their acquittals, connecting Yangru South Sea by road and Japan partners with East Sipic. Those stories after the break. Welcome back to the news. Provinces and districts are not submitting their acquittals. This was revealed today by Aihe Vaki, Acting Deputy Secretary for Program Implementation with the Department of Implementation and Rural Development. Mr. Vaki said a report summary from 2013 to 2015 shows a sharp decline in submitting of services improvement program acquittals. The presentation on the update on DSIP, PSIP and LLG SIP acquittals was done at the CIMC Governance and Service Delivery Sectoral Committee meeting. CIMC is the Consultative Implementation and Monitoring Council. Today's meeting focused on partnership and collaboration in strengthening systems and processes of accountability to improve governance and service delivery. Mr. Vaki said out of the 22 provinces, 2013 saw only four outstanding acquittal reports. In 2014, there were 12 outstanding acquittals, and in 2015, 15 provinces did not submit their reports. As for the DSIP submissions, of the 89 districts in the country, 15 did not submit their acquittals in 2013. That number grew to 24 in 2014. And in 2015, a whopping 60 districts failed to submit their acquittal reports. Mr. Vaki said the decline in submission of acquittals was concerning, especially as funding increases. Mr. Vaki said good governance and service delivery should be based on LLG, district and provincial development plans. He said the governance and service delivery should be closely monitored by key stakeholders. Established by the NEC, the goal of the CIMC is to ensure dialogue through consultative processes between government, private sector and the community. The end result is to try to have the recommendations followed up within government circles and implemented through law and policy. Deli Waigeno, National, MTV News. The community of Afawiya in the Yangaru South Sea district of East Sipic will now have better access to services following the opening of a missing road link. Locals told MTV News that for years they have been forced to walk to access basic services. However, today they are able to catch a PMV right to where they live. For the people of Afawiya in the Numbo LLG area of Yangaru South Sea district, this stretch of road is the first road access the local people have seen since independence. Mivla, you look in one black kind, first of kind, something, life for Mivla. Uh, start long, 1962 time, Mivla start become no one Wambla. Machine working kind road also. What member James Wahunji says for years they have been forced to walk for hours to the main highway to access services in Wiwek and other parts of the district. The time for Mivla, Mivla stop. Mibla sa kari man, lo hiya ogi pet kari go. Mibla sa ol mama la tiri virin pebi, oli pili mo la tai mibla sa kari. Lo hiya mibla sa take distance out ko ose long. Munji Felix, kami ko ose sa soya ose mibla sa kari long. Hiya na ogo bab. For the women, better road access means access to better health services. It also allows for proper education services to reach the community. La kari pini ni ol man sa ogi pet. The 2.3 kilometer stretch of road is one of many missing road links in the district which are currently being upgraded. Funds of over 330,000 kina were allocated by the district administration to complete the Afawiya to Munji road. 
construction began last year with over two kilometers level with gravel before the project moves into proper sealing later in the year. Last time people working my first clearance go. So with uh, first base, now second base, people put them ta uh, sorry, gravel, metro back go. But people look at the minister now, uh, what what next look bind blame come and ask him to make one move and make him. Now people finish with gravel so fast. Stanley Over Jr. National MTV News. The opening of a four-in-one classroom at the St. Patrick's Sasoya Primary School in the Yanguru Sausia District has again strengthened the partnership between the people of Japan and East Sipic Province. Local MP Richard Maru, during the opening ceremony last Sunday, told Japanese ambassador to PNG Satoshi Nakajima that the district is ready to partner Japan to better develop the district and the province as a whole. He said Japan must work close with East Sipic as they have ties dating back to World War II. The newly appointed Japanese ambassador made his first official trip outside of Port Mosby to East Sipic province last weekend. He was invited to open a four-in-one classroom at St. Patrick's Sasoya Primary School in the Numbo LLG of Yanguru Sausia. The classrooms, partly funded under Japan's grant assistance for grassroots projects, is the first project funded by the Japanese government in the district. However, MP Richard Maru told Ambassador Nakajima that this must be the start of a relationship aimed at developing the district and the province as a whole. We would like as a province, as a district, to work closer, very closely with the Japanese government and your office to take you more funding support for many of our projects that are much needed in our province. Minister Maru says Isipik province has been somewhat forgotten for its history with Japan during World War II. Everybody talks about the contribution of other provinces and I think nothing, not enough has been done to recognize the sacrifice of the Sipiks. So on behalf of our governor, people of Isipik, I think it's only fitting that you've started on this project by supporting us. Recently when your prime minister came, he made major commitments to fund many infrastructure projects in Isipik, and that hasn't happened. His Excellency Ambassador Satoshi Nakajima, who was made chief of the Sasoya community, said he was impressed with PNG in his first three weeks in office. He says Japan and PNG continues a rich friendship, which is vital for economic development for both countries. Based upon the existing strong bond of friendship between Papua New Guinea and Japan, I'm very happy that our economic and the political ties are developing rapidly in these days. I expect we will see a lot more Japanese come to East Pacific on business and our tourism in the future. Stanley Over Jr. National MTV News. Despite the government applauding the state of 36.5% in shares from Interoil to ExxonMobil, a Gulf landowner is calling for help to stop it. Chairman of Gulf Elk Antelope Bluff Landowner Association Tom Totore says numerous attempts for the government to consider equal bidding by resource owners failed after Interoil and the government declined the request. The shares include assets in the Elk and Antelope project areas. Bobcat, Rabto, Wahoo and Wildcat, all in Gulf province. Not much noise has been made by Gulf people regarding the sale of 36.5% shares in the Papua Gulf PNG LNG project. Yesterday, an outspoken chairman of Gulf Elk Antelope Bluff Landowner Association, Tom Tautara, said landowners were not given a chance in the bidding process. It is also abuse to the constitution of Papua New Guinea that a foreign company have come and caused a monopoly to take over the, the one-man company without no other competition. In a statement released yesterday, Petroleum and Energy Minister Nixon Duban said although there are issues with competition, the government is comfortable with its participation of 22.5 equity share under the Oil and Gas Act. However, the landowners feel that the chance of participation is being neglected by the state and developer. We cannot be many spectators on our own land. 
by sitting down, looking at it, and let the foreigners come and manipulate the system and override the rights of the people who owns the herit who owns the who have the heritage of the land and everything. Chairman Totara says Gulf people must not be silent over this matter. He called for help and believes there is a way out for better decision on the selling of the shares. The 36.5 percent says equates about 7.9 billion kina. Jack Lapave, Jr. National MTV News. Shukai Sports is next. Details after the break. Tukai Sports. Welcome to Chukai Sports. The SB Sports Awards 2017 edition marks a very special year for its major sponsor, SB Brewery, as the company celebrates its Silver Jubilee. SB Brewery Managing Director Stan Joyce said that this year the awards will be bigger and better, reassuring the organizing committee that no stones will be left unturned. An added criteria will see the public voting in on the top four categories, Male and Female Athlete of the Year Award, Team of the Year and National Performance of the Year, in which they feel deserves to win People's Choice of the Year Award. Closing date of the nominations is on April 3rd and nominations are expected to flood in from all over the country. A selection panel will review the nominations and select three finalists for each category who will attend the presentation on the night of May 27th at the Stanley Hotel in Port Moresby. The Pacific MMI Insurance Company has come on board to sponsor the annual Port Moresby Corporate Snooker Competition for the ninth consecutive year. At the launch yesterday, Pacific MMI Insurance Company Acting Managing Director Andrew Gogo presented a check of 20,000 kina to Port Moresby Billiards and Snooker Association. President of Palm Snooker Association John Chan says Pacific MMI's involvement has raised the standard of the competition in Port Moresby and has seen an increase in the number of players taking part in snooker. I'd like to thank Andrew um, and Pacific MMI for the ninth consecutive year for sponsoring this uh, corporate competition. PMMI Acting Managing Director Andrew Gogo presented a check of 20,000 to PMBSA to assist with the running of the competition. Without sponsorship, um, nothing would happen, so we're happy to present a check of 20000 for the competition for 2017. President Chan also mentioned that the nominations are opened last week and the 2017 Pacific MMI Port Mosby Snooker Competition is expected to queue off on Monday, the 6th of March, with the premier grade. There will be four, four grades in this competition, like last year and previous years, there will be premier grade. A grade, B grade and C grade. As of last night, they have received nominations for two teams in Premier Grade. Three for A grade, five for B grade and four for C grade and only six teams in its grade. We'd like to um, ask any other teams or, or captains in the past if they wish to put in their nomination that they should put it in ASAP uh, because we'll be restricting it to six team per grade. The facilities at Lamana Q Club, Laguna and Aviat clubs will be utilized due to limited number of tables. Meanwhile, team captains from each grade are advised to attend an important meeting next Monday, the 27th of this month, at the Lamana Q Club to discuss formats and other issues before competition queues off. Shane Saroya, National MTV Sports. The inaugural Newcrest New Island Grassroots Nines Rugby Challenge will start tomorrow at Londolovit Sports Oval on Lihir Island. Patron July Bal Totsik says the tournament is the first to be held on the island. Financial support coming from Newcrest and other business houses in Lihir. The organizers say the tournament has the potential to become a major annual provincial event, but depends on the success of this weekend's games. Major sporting activities happening on Lihir has been few and far between over the years. And this weekend's tournament is expected to recoup young talents and encourage healthier lifestyle through sports amongst the people on the gold mining island. Chukai Sports continues after the break. Don't go away.
True Kai Sports. Welcome back to True Kai Sports. The construction of the 40 million Kina Sir Hubert Murray Stadium came to a standstill due to lack of funds. Half of the stadium is yet to be completed and Sports Minister Justin Tichenko has called on the business community to work in partnership to complete the stadium. The incomplete Sir Hubert Murray Stadium has raised concerns among the general public as to when the stadium will be completed and why the construction has stopped. Sports Minister Justin Tichenko has approached a few business houses to partner with to complete its construction so that it can be utilised for big sporting events. Uh, for Hubert Murray Stadium, uh, we have uh, talked to three or four corporate bodies, one of them being BSP, our national bank here in Papua New Guinea, uh, to look at a tax credit scheme and also under a corporate governance uh, we're talking to some of our big mining companies in Kumu as well to look at where they can sponsor and come on board to be part of the um, finishing of this magnificent Hubert Murray Stadium. As you know, the economic uh, times in Papua New Guinea are very tight at this present time and uh, so we're looking at corporate sponsorship to finish off the stadium so the corporate sponsorship can be partners with the government to run and manage and maintain and finish uh, this magnificent Hubert Murray Stadium. Tachenko says under his leadership he will push this agenda so that the facility can be completed for the benefit of the people of Papua New Guinea and sports in the country. Still in negotiation, we're still working with our corporate clients. Uh, there's a lot of interest being shown, which is very pleasing. And I look forward in reporting back in the next coming months of who will assist to finally finish Hubert Murray Stadium. Uh, it's been a lot of pain for me as Minister not being able to finish this stadium, um, but I am determined, believe me, I am determined uh, to get it finished uh, before my term ends as Minister for Sports and have a sensible outcome uh, for the long-term future of Hubert Murray Stadium and for the future of all the sporting games and activities that will be played there uh, into the future. For now, the Sir Hubert Murray Stadium remains closed with not much happening. The stadium cost about 40 million kina. Godwin Eki, National MTV Sports. New Caledonia and New Zealand have booked their tickets to the 2017 FIFA Under-17 World Cup in India after defeating Solomon Islands and Papua New Guinea respectively in two nail-biting semi-final clashes in the OFC Under-17 Championship in Tahiti yesterday. New Zealand sealed their sixth consecutive qualification but needed a 94th minute winner from substitute Oliver White to edge past Papua New Guinea 2-1 just as their match looked headed for penalties. In the second semi-final, the first minutes of the match looked like a repeat of New Zealand's 11-0 win against Samoa in the group stage, with the defending champions up one goal to nil in the third minute after Papua New Guinea's Aben Pukue tried to clear a cross but found the back of his own net. Papua New Guinea would soon score again, this time past Zach Jones and Bathy Kerobin volleyed a deflection into the net ending the first half with the scores tied 1-1. The second half saw both teams fight neck and neck in the middle of the park, taking turns of pressure in their opponent's goal, but failing to break the back line. Charles Sprague stood out up front for the Kiwis with several on-target attempts, but Graham Berigami's quick hands blocked every one of Sprague's chances and kept the Papua New Guineans in the game. Oliver White made his heroic move when he charged into the penalty box and in full stretch reached a toe to the ball and sent it into the bottom right corner in the third minute of extra time to send his nation to the final and to the 2017 FIFA Under-17 World Cup in India. New Zealand coach Danny Hay felt very lucky to walk away with the win against a very talented and passionate Papua New Guinea side. Really, really difficult encounter, which we knew it was going to be. Um, look, we had chances probably to put that away a lot earlier in the, in the second half and uh, 
their keeper pulled out some incredible saves. So you know you got to you got to take your hat off to Papua New Guinea. They uh, they really fought well and um, showed a lot of pride and a lot of spirit in playing for their country. With his initial goal of the competition achieved, he is now looking forward to give one last fight in performance in the OFC Under 17 Championship final before he turns his focus to preparation for the FIFA Under 17 World Cup. Despite their last minute loss to New Zealand ending their World Cup dream, Papua New Guinea coach Harrison Kamake was stunned by their performance and proud of the relentless effort put in by his young side. Yeah, it was, it was, it was really amazing. Um, the boys uh, really uh, 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 went up to the challenge. Um, unfortunately, um, it's a bit disappointing. Also, at the same time, uh, it's unfortunate that they scored in the um, additional time and um, heartbreaking for the boys. Papua New Guinea will now face the Solomon Islands in the third and fourth playoff. Jeremy Moggy, National TV Sports. And that ends Chukai Sports. The weather details when we come back. Chukai Sports. True Kai Sports. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Looking at the weather forecast for the next 24 hours, mostly fine in all main centres of the southern region. In the Momasa region, cloudy periods in Lei, shower or two in Medang and mostly fine in Wewek and Vanimo. In the New Guinea Islands region, mostly fine in Loringau and Buka, showers in Kavieng and thundery showers in Kokopo, Rabao and Kimbe. And in the Highlands region, mostly fine in all centres. The weather details are proudly brought to you by Dulux Weather Shield. With doing with Dulux. Now recapping our main stories for tonight. Lloyd's Governor General lies in state for final viewing. More awareness and understanding needed on cancer and Medang dealing with widespread cases of malaria. And that's been the new sports and weather for tonight, Thursday, the 23rd of February 2017. On behalf of the entire national MTV News team, I'm Helen Sayer. Pleasant viewing. Good night.